Hello there, everyone. Welcome to Digital Nomad Mastery, the podcast and the video cast where we teach you how to make money while traveling the world. I'm over here in Trinidad and Tobago enjoying the beautiful island life. Unfortunately, my internet is not very good, and Trinidad isn't really known for the amazing internet speed for digital nomads. So, hey, you know, as a digital nomad, that's probably the biggest struggle that I face, and I know a lot of other digital nomads face, is bad internet. Uh, so we're here on the call with a good friend, Scott, uh, who's our uh, co-host. And ironically, of all places, uh, Sky, our guest, is actually in the Ukraine as well. And this is the first time ever in the history of all of our podcasts, all 90 plus episodes that we've had our co-host and a guest in the exact same room, in the exact same city, in the exact same country, in the exact same continent, in the exact same time zone. So what are the chances? So, Scott, uh, why didn't you share a little bit about how you ended up in Ukraine and tell us about uh, how you ended up connecting with our guest. And, Ricky, I wanted to say, too, is this the first time where we haven't had uh, a guest who was on a totally different continent from both of us? Uh, possibly, possibly. I think I've interviewed some guests uh, who were, for example, in South America at the same time as me. I remember Kendrick was actually in Suriname and I was in Guyana. So, uh, we were both in South America during the interview. So, so a little bit different here when you guys are in the same room. So quite a unique, uh, unique uh, thing. And uh, by the way, if you're just listening to this on audio, we have a video version on YouTube. So make sure you check out the video version to see us all connecting through the power of technology. That's right. It'll be in the description for sure. So I'm in. Od we are in Odessa in the Ukraine on the Black Sea. Uh, it's been a beautiful day. It rained this morning. It was stormy and lightning last night, but by the afternoon, cleared up. It's a beautiful day. And uh, to our great surprise, we were in the same city at the same time, and we had a nice lunch, wandered around. I've been here uh, a little over a week, and you've been here two days? Uh, 24 hours. 24 <laughs> hours. So we, and we were... We weren't that far apart, like probably about 10 minute walk for yeah. me. Yeah, 10, 20 minutes. Uh, and we met in the middle and it turned out Sky had not seen my hood. So I took him around and I showed him all the sights. So it's really quite amazing. Hi, when, uh, when I've been somewhere a week and I <laughs> act like a tour guide. It was pretty cool. There she is. <laughs> that, that sounds good. That, and by the way, again, if you're just listening, uh, all these references are to the video. So uh, I'm here in Trinidad and Tobago, and this is my daughter who actually just got amazing braids. So she looks like a local, and everyone just thinks she's a local. She's from Vancouver, BC, Canada. I'm Indian. My wife's Filipino. She's, she's Indian, Canadian, Filipino, looking like a Trinidadian. You look <laughs> so pretty. You look so pretty. I like your hair. And <laughs> and I got my hair cut yesterday. Do you like my hair? Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. You have to say it louder. Do you have a question for Scott? Ask him where is he? Where are you? I'm in Odessa in the Ukraine. Where are you? Mm -hmm. So we actually have three co-hosts this time. We have we have Scott, myself, and Rian. Yes. <laughs> We are in, I don't Jamaica. know. No. Well, now we're in Trinidad. We're in Trinidad. Yeah. We just flew in from uh, Tobago to Trinidad last night. So, All right. So take it away, Scott. Tell us a little bit about what, had, what how the heck did you end up in uh, Ukraine uh, with Sky? And tell us about how is it over there in Ukraine? Uh, well, it's good. They're having a bit of a rough time. There's no doubt the economy is struggling and there's a little bit of conflict going on with Russia. So there's uh, some tension in the air. But uh, other than that, like in Odessa, it's a beautiful city and it's a tourist town. Everybody is out having a good time. And I have to tell you, I had an amazing experience getting my hair cut because I've walked around this area <laughs> for the last week and I saw nothing that looked like a hairdresser or a barber. And uh, the place I'm staying, I talked to them and he said, oh, just a second. He got out his phone and he does something and he finds this place and he shows me on the map. And I have walked by that spot at least 10 times. So he calls him up and he makes an appointment for this for yesterday morning at 11 o'clock. So I say, thank you very much. And then as soon as he leaves, 
I go to that spot to look around because I know tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock, I'm not going to be able to find it. So I walk up, I walk down, I can't find it. So I go home and I think, well, tomorrow maybe I'll be more lucky. So today I took Sky and I stopped a half a block before the barber shop and I told him the story and I said, okay, let's walk and see if you can find it. And <laughs> missed it the first time down. <laughs> <laughs> we missed it. So in the morning when I go, I have about quarter, quarter to 11. I'm a little bit early. I get to where it's supposed to be on the map. I can't. I have no clue where it is. But there's a waiter standing outside one of the cafes. So I go up to him and I said, do you know where the barbershop is? And I said the name, uh, Fitz, right? Fitz. Mm -hmm. The Fitz. The Fitz. And he looks at me and he points like one door down from him. So I go, okay. And I walk and then I walk up and I look and I look at him and I go in here and he goes, yep, it's a bar. It's like a full on <laughs> bar. So I, okay, so I walk in, like this is taking total like leaps of faith because there was no way there's a bar, it's a bar. You can see booze all over the place, chandeliers. There is a full on bar with a, with a bartender. I get in and I look and right at the back is three barber seats. And I go up and the lady says, oh, Scott, thank you for being here. Hands me off to the uh, the barber and he cuts my hair and I, and we went I introduced you today right yeah. <laughs> so so I could not believe there is this bar and I, I took pictures of me and behind me I didn't realize when I was taking the pictures is all these bottles of booze <laughs> so <laughs> you never know what you're going to experience when you when you travel well you shared a funny story so let me share one too. <laughs> uh, what happened is yesterday we went to Tobago. So for those of you who don't know, Trinidad and Tobago is a small country, uh, a two group of islands in the southern Caribbean, uh, Caribbean uh, just north of Venezuela. And it's technically part of North America, even though it's 20 kilometers from South America. So what happened yesterday is we were planning to come from Tobago to Trinidad by plane. Uh, we had already taken the ferry and we're taking the plane back. What happened is uh, there was actually a ferry in the morning. It had broken down, and it had stranded about 400 people who wanted to get back to Trinidad. So these 400 people ended up rushing to the airport to try to get the plane. And what happened is we got to the airport, and they said, sorry, there was like literally hundreds of people waiting for standby tickets. Um, so we're like, can we fly today? They're like, well, there's a wait list over there to get on the wait list. <laughs> so there was a line to get on a wait list of 50 people. So... We stood in the line and we're like, this is not going anywhere. And then I was pretty creative and travel allows you to be creative and resourceful. So I actually went all the way up to the front and I said, excuse me, I have kids. Is it okay? Uh, because they're getting whiny, cranky, hungry. Is it okay if we uh, go in front? And the lady um, at the line, she said, uh, okay. So I managed to bypass 50 people, got a standby ticket, but we still had to wait seven hours in this small airport in Tobago um, for a 20-minute flight. <laughs> oh, no. We got there at 2 p.m. We, we, we got there at 2 p.m. We flew out at 9 p.m. and we arrived in Trinidad at 9.20. <laughs> so I've never had that happen. Seven-hour wait for a 20-minute flight. But luckily, we're here in Trinidad. And I was really worried that we wouldn't be able to get the flight. And then obviously, we have to fly to Colombia. So luckily, it all worked out. And it's a kind of a funny story to tell because um, sometimes when you have problems, uh, those create the best stories on the road. They sure do. They sure do. Well, Sky, it's your turn. <laughs> uh, I've actually... <laughs> Go ahead, Sky. So I've been on the road for two and a half years. Uh, I've gone through a, a different phases of my travels. The first year, I went through 35 different countries, basically just with a backpack on my back, about uh, 90 pounds worth of gear, and... I didn't really have any specific path or destination. I would kind of go to an airport, or not even an airport, a train station, a bus station, and just pick the cheapest ticket. And kind of walk, went all around Europe that way, made it down to Southeast Asia. Um, and recently I've been kind of slowing down, making little home bases here and there. But uh, about two weeks ago, I kind of set out on the road again for just two or three weeks uh, to get to some more of the countries I hadn't been to yet in Europe. And I uh, got to Moldova and had uh, some very interesting adventures there, especially with my accommodations. Um, you know, obviously, we're in a country um, 
not only is it you know a little bit more impoverished, um, you know the electricity is very expensive there, but it's not usually that hot, so they don't you know necessarily have air conditioning and fans in all of the you know hotels, hostels, or whatever. And um, mm. so between having nights when I'm literally laying in bed sweating all night long, where it's 32, 33 degrees all night long, um, you know, going to a hostel, asking them to do my laundry, them then losing my laundry, uh, luckily finding it before I left the country, a few minutes before I left the country. Um, they, they didn't do the laundry, but at least I had the clothes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it's kind of one thing after another. Uh, I had my first adventure in, um, I should say my first negative adventure in Cyprus with a host on couchsurfing uh, accepting me and then never telling me where to go until midnight of the night I was, the day after I was supposed to be there. The day after you were supposed <laughs> to be there. Yeah, so wow. uh, the next day she goes, oh, we can come tonight and stay. So I was like, okay, so where do I go? You know, so, you know, Thursday night she said I could stay there and then never got back to me. And then Friday morning she said, okay, so you're going to come tonight? I said, yeah, where do I go? And at midnight she told me, well, the room's ready for you. Why haven't you called me? Here's my phone number. <laughs> she gave me her phone number at midnight and asked me why I hadn't called her earlier. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> so, Yeah. That was, That's, you know, I want to talk about that a little bit because I had a, I have an experience that was almost like yours mm -hmm. with Workaway, and Workaway is a place is a place a site where you can go and uh, you can volunteer for you know twenty or twenty five hours a week, and you'll get you'll get uh, you won't necessarily get paid, but you'll get food and you'll get accommodation. And my next, not my next Workaway, the one after that in August is going to be Norway which I really am excited about because even though I had no plans to go to Norway or Scandinavia, it's going to be August, so it'll be warm, and it's a retreat center, and it really sounds great. And I've, so about four months ago, this was finalized, like, yes, Scott, we want you to come. We want you to come at this time. Everything was fine. Then I sent him an email because, believe it or not, I ended up hanging out with a work aware who had worked as a volunteer at this same place. So we got on to uh, work away and we sent him a message saying, oh, here's, here she is, I'm here, we're together, we're having fun and we were talking about you, just wanted to let you know. No response. So then a couple months go by and I'm, I'm thinking, well, I need to start making plans, I gotta get my flights and all that sort of stuff. So I sent him another message, no response. Then I got a message from him. We have a problem, we need help now, can you come now? <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry, I'm at another workaway right now, I can't come. No response to that. And then I sent him another message, like, you know, I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> I know I'm going to Norway, but I don't know where. No response. And then, so I'm thinking what you're thinking. I'm thinking, I've got this whole month blocked off, and am I actually going to be at the workaway, or am I going to have to be looking at something else? Like, what am I going to do? And it's 30 days from now, which yeah. is, you know, 30 days sounds like a long time, but it'll be here before you know it. And I know that, right? Yeah. And if I'm going to go do another work away, then I need to, like, find out, right? And there, There's a couple of things about that. And because I have a whole blog post on my blog, uh, skytravels.com backslash work away, and specifically about... Um, some of the downfalls of Workaway. And one of them is the fact that a lot of these places, especially a hotspot like Norway, some of these places are getting 50 to 100 emails every single day yeah. from volunteers, and they just get inundated. Uh, and also, uh, HelpX is actually a little bit better, only in so much as the fact that the HelpX website actually emails the hosts uh, constantly when they don't answer their, their messages oh, to okay. their volunteers. So work away, you know, I've, I've they had send times, one, they send one email. I know. Right. And I've had times when I've sent out, you know, 20, 30, 50, you know, I don't know how many requests and not heard back from any of them. And with HelpX, you know, obviously, you know, they can just ignore the emails and not right. answer you, but you'll usually get an answer back even if it's mostly no. Right. So, and that's all you really want. 
So the good news was was that he emailed me yesterday okay. or two days ago and said, uh, well, in the last week, I got an email back. We're looking forward to you coming. Uh, are you, and here's the address. So then I put it into Google Maps. And it's only three hours from Oslo, just pretty much straight north, which was good. And it was like, are you going to drive? It was the same. You wonder if it's English translation or what. But it was like, are you going to drive? Because if you do, we'll pick you up at this little town. And I'm like, if, if I'm going to drive, then I'll just drive all the way, right? Mm -hmm. So it didn't make any sense. So I think it was just like, are you going to take a, I don't know, a bus or whatever. But there's a bus that goes up. And I said, I'm going to take the bus. And here's the time that it'll arrive. Can you pick me up? Please let me know because I need to you know, buy the ticket. Because you don't know, it's August, maybe the bus will be full. So, right. But anyway, I had a happy ending, and you're here, so you had a happy ending. Yeah. And well, that's the thing. Is like, you know, I, I mentioned this as my bad experience with couchsurfing, and I do want to point out, I've couchsurfed all around the world. I've had, I don't know how many dozens, if not a hundred hosts, you know, in the past three years, and this is the only time when I've actually had a bad experience. Right. Like couch surfing, you know, I've talked to, you know, as a, as a permanent traveler, I've talked to hundreds of travelers around the world. And yeah, I actually do know of two other bad experiences. That other people have. Yeah. But that's two out of thousands. Yes. That's like, wonderful. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about how did you get into couch surfing? Um, well, actually, my very first couch surfing was on the West Coast U.S., and um, it was when I originally quit my job and I was going from Los Angeles to Portland. I was actually riding my motorcycle over the Christmas holiday, uh, literally from, I think I was riding on the 26th and 27th. Wow. And I kept trying to get a ride share to go up and I had one and it canceled. I had another one and it canceled. And then I finally went, you know, what? I'm just going to drive my motorcycle up there which was a horrible idea. It was 1,100 miles with an average temperature of 33 degrees Fahrenheit. And probably wet. Uh, 120 miles of rain and 60 miles of snow. <laughs> uh, and everything I own basically oh, is wow. on the back of my motorcycle, so I can't get off of it and go warm up in a cafe. Right. But I didn't want to do the entire thing in a single day, so I did six hours the first day and then had a couch surfing place in Nevada, California, and then did the rest of the trip the next day. Wonderful. And the great thing is, like, you know, every couchsurfing host I've ever had, we're still, you know, connected. I'm, you know, we're great friends. Uh, in fact, I just missed that host. Uh, I ended up staying with him a year later with my dad when we did a, a road trip on the PCH. <laughs> and I called them up. You know, I had their phone number. I called them up an hour before I arrived. And it was like, um, you know, we didn't hit the campground we were going for and it's too late to drive. Can we crash there? And I need two places this time. And they're like, yeah, well, I got my two couches. Come stay with us. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, but it's it really is because it's traveling is a community. Yes. And like you were just mentioning about the guy who you met in uh, Medellin, Colombia, and then ran into in Germany. Yeah, who would have thought that? <laughs> and we're here together in the same city. Yes. Uh, I've run into some guys now three or four times mm -hmm. around the world. I actually just missed a guy by a day in Moldova at a hostel who I'd run into at the same hostel two, a year and a half ago, in, or two years ago, in Albania. Wow. And the guys at the hostel were just describing this American and his tattoos. I'm like, oh my God, you mean Austin? And then <laughs> the, the name popped out. I, hadn't even, I didn't even remember the guy's name until I, that popped out of my mouth. <laughs> and they were probably shocked that you knew. Oh, of course. Of yeah. course. <laughs> My, my funniest story was actually from 1978 when it comes to this sort of thing because I was in India and in New Delhi and I met this f fellow from Britain. So I'd come from Southeast Asia into India. He'd come from Africa into, into India. We, we had met at the hostel and then it was like, see you later. And about a week and a half later, I was in Goa and I had taken a train down to uh, Bombay, Mumbai, and then I'd train down to some place and then a, a bus into Goa and I'm getting off the bus and I know like four people in all of India right and two of them are in Calcutta and I don't know where the other two were and all, I get off the bus and there's this Scott Scott and I'm like, what <laughs> yeah Scott you know it was this British guy and he he says yeah I was just walking by I looked over and I saw you get off the bus I can't believe it 
I can't believe it either, right? Of course, that's a country with what one point. Well, back uh, then it was nine hundred million. Or yeah, something, that's right. But. That's right, nine hundred million. <laughs> and and even even then, just you could easily be in the same town and miss each other the whole time, right? Right. The and there was block. no Facebook. There was no Twitter. There was no way of us knowing where we were. And he was like, "Ah, it's God." I was like, "Oh, cool." I love that. Uh, now. Oh, I got to share a story too, guys. Uh, you'll be sharing all these amazing stories. Uh, I actually was a couch surfer too, surprisingly enough, before I got married and kids. It is very hard to couch surf as a family because my wife and kids won't sit fit on the same couch. But <laughs> before we got married, um, I used to couch surf as well. And um, I couch surfed in about 50 different uh, places around the world. And I'll tell you one funny story. I was in Brisbane, Australia, and I was staying with a gay couple, and I love gay people. They're some of the most friendliest people in the world. And uh, for some reason, uh, when I got there, uh, they took off their clothes, and it was very awkward um, because they were gay nudists. And uh, this is their home, and I was couch surfing there, and they were walking around nude the whole, I think I stayed there for two nights, and um, I kind of just uh, went with it because, hey, this is their house. If they want to be nude in the house, who am I to tell them otherwise? Uh, I wish they would. T they told me on the profile that uh, they were going to be nude while I was there because they were, felt very uncomfortable. And uh, I was a 20-something-year-old backpacker, and I'm obviously straight, you know, married with kids. But uh, it was just a weird experience. And they actually said to me, why don't we get a picture of you nude as well and send it to your mom? <laughs> and I was like, uh, no, I don't think – I think my mom is going to freak out if we did that. So, again, uh, unexpected stuff happens when you're on the road, but these make some of the best stories. And uh, I have so many more couch surfing stories, but uh, I got actually, I'll tell you one more. When I was in uh, Rockhampton, um, I was staying with a great family, uh, five kids, and they kept trying to persuade me to become Mormon. Uh, I had a room at that couch surfing place, and they had like the Book of Mormon everywhere. And then they took me to uh, their, um, uh, I think it's called the Temple. Uh, and then uh, pretty much the whole trip I was there, the whole purpose of the stay was to convert people to Mormonism. And of course, uh, I'm not a Mormon, and I don't, I don't intend to be one. But those just make great stories, um, you know, and I have so many more. Uh, when I was in California, I was staying in a Rastafarian place, and the whole place smelled of marijuana the whole time I was there. So all my clothes, everything I owned is all marijuana scented, and uh I think people will probably think I also smoke marijuana after that stay. And there are many more, but uh, those are a few of my funny stories. And this is great, you know, to be connecting with each other, just sharing stories, because that's what travel is all about. There's a great saying, travel will leave you speechless, and then it will turn you into a storyteller. And that's what we all are. We're storytellers. So, Sky, just getting back to the couch surfing again, what would be some tips you would give people who, if they, they had never couch surfed, like I've never couch surfed, mm -hmm. and although I have, I'm actually a member of the site and I have looked at, at couch surfing, um, you know, what are some of the things that you would re recommend that people consider when they're thinking about starting out as a couch surfer? Mm -hmm. um, there's two things. One is, uh, a great way to, um, and actually the better way to get started on the uh, Couchsurfing website is to start as a host. Oh. Because, and that's going to do two things. One, it's going to get you just kind of comfortable with what the experience is, uh, you know, what it's like, what it's, you know, kind of what, you, what you're going to be, what your host is going to be expecting kind of thing. Mm. And also that builds up your references. And because a lot of places won't even accept you if you don't have the references. Right. That's a great way to get references. Right. And that's also the whole purpose of the site is to turn it about. In fact, it was uh, a couple of years until I finally got to Thailand and got my own condo when I could start hosting. Up to that point, I was only a guest. And I, it started to feel kind of awkward of like, you know, I've now stayed with all, all these people and I've never oh. returned the favor. Right. Um, now, that was just because I literally did have my own house. But... Um, you know, anytime I could or anyway, you know, I was always looking at making them dinner, uh, cleaning the house, like anything I could do to kind of contribute. Know, yeah, yeah, you want to contribute for rather sure. than a monetary, you know, investment in it. Um, now, if that's not possible, if you're like me and didn't have a house or whatever, the second thing you can do and should do is start going to meetups, whether they're in your own town before you start traveling or as you start traveling. Find what events are going on in the cities, couch surfing events. Go to those events, 
make friends with them. You don't even have to stay with them. But what you can do is just, because they're all on couch surfing, you know, get really, you know, maybe you can go on a tour with them and then, you know, just casually at the end of the time go, hey, by the way, I'm kind of new to couch surfing. I don't have any references yet. Do you, you've hung out with me for a few hours. Do you mind writing a reference? Right. Good and idea. I had two or three like that as well um, at the very beginning. And then um, what started happening is I then started having that conversation with other people and they're like, oh, can you write me a reference? And I'd write them a reference, and then they'd write me a reference in return, you know. Right, right. So then that would also build up my references. So you've got this whole kind of train reaction going. And obviously, you know, if I, you know, there was a few times where I'd meet someone for five or ten minutes, and they go, oh, yeah, I've been trying to get on couch surfing. Can you write me a reference? I'm going, you know what? I don't know you well enough mm. to write that reference. <laughs> right. So Because also it's the integrity. You have to keep the integrity for sure. Right. And Couchsurfing just did a huge overhaul on the website. They got rid of, I don't know how many millions of inactive users. Oh. Uh, they I better did, check. I might not be on there anymore. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, the whole interface is different. And the worst part is they've actually monetized it. So you used to be able to have unlimited um, requests for free. And now you're limited to 10 a week unless you buy a yearly subscription which is only thirty dollars a year, but again, it's it defeats the whole purpose of the website. Right. So I really struggled with couchsurfing when I was using it uh, to actually get hosted enough, and it took me literally copy paste, copy paste, copy paste. Uh, what was your experience uh, with couchsurfing in terms of uh, um, what is the ratio of number of requests to actually getting hosted? Very good question as well, um, because. Uh, it, it goes into this two aspects of that. One is your filters on who you're looking for. And the second is where and when you're going. And I kind of learned my lesson after the first year. Like I tried to get a host in London and I must have sent out about 200 requests. And I had about nine or 10 people respond to me, all of which declined. And then I had the same thing in Edinburgh where I sent out dozens and dozens and dozens of requests and literally did not have a single person respond to me. Um, so basically, and I was telling someone else this a couple days ago about 80, you know, you don't have this problem in America, America, if you now, obviously this is a generality and you know, this is not the absolute truth, but most people, they take a vacation, they're going to go home and they're just going to sit on the couch and watch a movie and check their emails for work. Or they might go out, you know, to, um, the local spa or, maybe to the next state for a couple days and head back. You, uh, America happens to be one of the only 10 countries in the world that does not require employers to give employees paid vacation time, which I think is absolutely crazy. I mean, we're talking about a modern developed country here. But what that leads to in Europe, um, most of the countries or many of the countries have a mandatory 30-day vacation time for each year for our, all the employees. So what happens is in the summer, uh, you have entire countries taking vacation for, you know, the month of August kind of thing. Uh, and just in general, basically about 80% of Europe is on vacation throughout the months of July and August. And what that leads to is the 80% are trying to stay with the 20% who didn't go on vacation. And you get a massive I bottleneck. See. I see. So there's a couple of ways around that. Uh, one of the key ways is you just go to non-touristy spots. You pick a place like Middleburg, Netherlands, which no one's ever heard of, but it is a gorgeous town. Everything's made of brick. Everything. Every building, road, monument, wall. It's, I mean, I don't know how many billions of bricks they used. Uh, you know, it's 10 kilometers away from the beach. It's the perfect place to go visit. The town has 50,000 people, and of those 50,000, 1,300, or roughly 5% 5, 5 of the town, are on couch surfing. Really? So I sent out four requests for the two days I was going to be there, and got three people accept me, and then kind of had to like bargain of who, was, who I was going to stay with. I then wow. went to Connus, Lithuania, sent out, I think, five requests, they all happened to know each other and they were like trying to one-up each other going, well, if you stay with me, I'm going to take you to this resort and make you this food. And the other person was, you know, and it just became like a game. Um, so really the trick is stay off 
if you're going to go the beaten path, yeah, and, or stay off of you know the um, the holiday season. I made the mistake of trying to couch surf in Istanbul during Ramadan. Doesn't work. <laughs> um, yeah, so you know you, you have to just be smart of where and when you go. And the second thing is, I do a very um, tailored filter. Um, now there's there's a couple things like I, I'm a little bit more picky. I, I liked and I've I've opened it up a little bit more. Like I used to only stay with people who are like my age bracket, um, you know, people who shared similar interests. Now I could not care less. But what I do is uh, the one filter I always use is I look for people who um, have been active within the past month, or if there's a lot of people, I'll narrow it down to the past week. And then I'll look through those people and I'll look for people who have a few references or maybe even, no, you know, no references or only one or two, but not a lot of references. If there's like 30 or 40 references, I'm probably going to skip them because they're probably the people who are getting dozens and dozens and dozens of requests. Mm, great tip. And then you can also see what their response ratio is. And I will only pick people who have at least a 50% response ratio um, unless I have a very few options. I'll also, um, I'll tend to request people who have their settings at maybe accepting guests, uh, cause there's three, there's actually four settings. There is accepting guests, maybe accepting guests, not accepting guests and wants to meet up. And I'll usually try to target the maybe accepting guests because everyone else is targeting the accepting guests. So those are the guys who are getting less requests. Mm, good point. Uh, and also some of the people who only want to meet up is actually interesting. They want to meet up to get to know you first before they're willing to host you. Mm. And not always. There's, there's a couple. Um, and then the third thing is always set a public trip. You tend to get, ex now unfortunately, especially if uh, I've heard some of the worst stories of girls uh, of obviously not staying at places, but some of the messages that they get, you tend to get some of the creeps coming out of the woodwork when you do that, but it is still a good way to find people. And so what you mean is by making my trip public, people that are on couch surfing that are where I'm going to be know, and they might approach me and say, if you look looking for a place, Scott, I got a couch. Is that what you mean? Yeah. There's, there's an option on couch surfing to let you create a public trip. And he tells you, you, you tell them what dates you'll be in the city and what you need. If you just want to meet up, if you basically it's selling, saying that you're going to the city. Right. Uh, and there's a fourth, third or fourth option, uh, which is like a, a last resort, which is literally last resort. And it's, uh, uh, if you have the desktop version, it doesn't work on mobile devices, but there's couch surfing groups and many cities, not all of them will have an emergency couch surfing group for that city. So I went to the city, I was going to be staying with you, but something happened, you had to leave town because of an emergency or something, you can't host me, and now I go to this group and they say, okay, you know, we need someone to host Scott because Sky had a problem and can't. Yeah. Um, lines. You'd usually post and like, hey, I mean, you know, this is an emergency, I need someone to host me tonight, and that will actually email directly every member in that group, and there might wow. be... There might be 10 members in that group. There might be 100. Uh, you know, in Cyprus, there was one member, and I actually had already messaged her, messaged her directly, and she was in Japan that night. So <laughs> I already, I, I actually wrote to her. I went, you know, it's a bummer that you're the only person in the emergency group, <laughs> and I already know you're not in town. Uh, but I came to my rescue in Edinburgh <laughs> once and in uh, Bristol, England once. Cool. That's, those are great tips. So one question I have is how long is, uh, a, well, let's just say like normal couch surfing visit? Like, is it one night? Is it, is it a month? Like, what, what can you kind of expect? Um, I usually try to plan my visits for two or three nights. Okay. Um, I know there's been many, many, many times when I've only done one night because that's just how long I was in that city. Um, but... You know, couchsurfing is more than just having a bed. Couchsurfing is about meeting a local and mm. getting to know them and, you know, sharing a dinner or exploring the town or, you know, uh, it's a personal experience. 
And when you only stay for a night, it becomes a little impersonal. Right. You know, if I'm going to be getting to the city at, you know, 11 o'clock at night and starting a tour the next morning at 8 a.m., I'm probably only going to, you know, I'd have to you be won't desperate have yes. to request a couch surfing host. You know, I have to be like Copenhagen where hostels are too expensive. But, you know, I just, I feel too awkward. Right, right. You know, requesting that. The and then you don't, but you don't want to overstay your welcome either by being there for a week, right? So I usually try to go two or three days, um, and if I do plan to stay in the city longer, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll just leave the rest of the time open. Uh, now and there's been uh, three, four, maybe even five hosts where I've stayed those two or three days, and we just really got along, and they were like, "Hey, are you going to be?" hanging around longer. And I was like, well, actually, yeah, I didn't really have a place to stay yet. You know, mm. you know it'd be great if you could stay. Right. Oh, good. So, and, you know, there's been times when uh, there was a girl in uh, Edinburgh uh, who was literally leaving. She, like, I had booked for two days. And she goes, well, I'm going back to Latvia with my boyfriend. I just finished uni. Uh, but if you want to stay longer, my flatmate is also on couch surfing uh <laughs> you stay with her but she's also leaving in two days back to italy because she also finished uni here um so you know the long you could stay another two days if you really need a place I went, great <laughs> so it sounds like a really interesting community to be a part of it is it, it's it's one of my favorite parts about travel in fact is being part of that community beautiful so tell us about some of your hosting experiences too, because it's one thing to be a guest, uh, a whole other thing to be a host. Uh, we actually hosted in Vancouver, BC, Canada, a few guests. I mean, we lived in a small condo, uh, and obviously I have three young kids, but we had a couch and we have a floor. So we definitely welcome people. But I, I got overwhelmed by Vancouver, which is a pretty hot, it's a hot spot for tourism, especially in the summer months, like June, July, August, September, a lot of tourists coming to Vancouver. So what I found is so many people would be requesting my place. Literally about 10, 15, 20 people a, a day sometimes. Yeah. And uh, I couldn't respond to them all. Uh, so, so I also had a generic pop and taste thing. Sorry, uh, you can my meet up. It's called One Travel is Local. Uh, so tell us about your experience as a host. Uh, did you also get overwhelmed? And how was um, you know the experience? Any cool stories from the hosting side of things? Um, not I, No, not really, because I was hosting in Thailand. And the hostels in Thailand are about 2 to $3 a night. So uh, couch surfing in Thailand is actually almost nominal. It's Bangkok's got um, more, but Chiang Mai had very little. Uh, I hosted a couple people. Um, one of them, <laughs> unfortunately, they, they they weren't the most honest people, uh, and the second one actually turned out even to be a druggie. So, uh, didn't wasn't doing drugs when they were staying at my condo, but you know, smoking a lot um, and stuff. And yeah, but again, it's like I think the biggest feeling I have as a human being is I will trust anybody regardless. Uh, you know, I loan out money to people all the time. Uh, I've been burned a few times. I, you know, it's just like, I just inherently, I believe that man is basically good and I just will always trust people. And unless, you know, obviously there's times when I see someone, I'm like, okay, I'm not going to trust you because I see the kind of person you are. But even then, you know, it's, um, if they needed a place to crash and I had a place for them to crash, even if I didn't trust them, I'd probably still give them a place to crash because, again, it's all about the karma. It's about paying it forward. And I like to treat others the way I'd want them to treat me, even though I might not think they might treat me that way. <laughs> so, yeah, it's... Um, I definitely look forward to... My, one of my plans, actually, is to get a tiny home and uh, travel around Europe and eventually the world and that. I actually think it'd be really fun to host in a little tiny home, you know, just traveling around. I have no idea how that would work on couch surfing because I sometimes don't know where I'm going to be the next week. So it'd be basically last minute requests all the time. But um, let's see how it works. You know, hopefully it's 
a van or a little uh, RV or camper or whatever big enough for two people. That sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Did we lose you? Uh, so, Sky, besides uh, your couch surfing, tell us about uh, your travel blog. You have a pretty influential travel blog. Uh, what are the major themes and topics uh, you write about in your blog? All right. Um, well, it's basically an adventure blog. Uh, it started off as more of like a budget travel blog because, you know, I, I left the U.S. without much in my pocket. And the biggest thing is I wanted to inspire others to travel no matter, you know, where they were. You know, everyone goes, oh, we can't travel to Europe because it's so expensive, you know, and I'd have to save $5,000 for a week vacation there. Uh, my flight from Los Angeles to London direct, nonstop, um, and last minute was $180. And I spent less than 100 pounds, which is at that time about $135, in my first 10 days in the UK traveling around, um, which UK residents to this day look at me and say, that's impossible. So, and that was with, that was before I knew all the tricks and tips on how to save money there. So, you know, I, I started with that and after, you know, two and a half years of traveling the world, this is actually my 44th country in the Ukraine. Um, you know, I have gone on press trips. I've met up with some of the biggest bloggers around the world. Um, you know, I've stayed in nice hotels. I've done amazing bus tours around and I've kind of taken the blog up to looking for those adventures. Um, so now I'm more concentrating on um, making the most out of your travel. You know, obviously I'll still help the budget travelers, but if you have, you know, a little bit more wherewithal, you know, what kind of attractions are available? What kind of hostels or hotels or B&Bs could you stay in? Where are the good meals? So I'm also looking for those things. And also just the great stories and um, any kind of travel tips. You know, I've got stories about couch surfing, work away, trusted house sitters, Airbnbs, um, you know, different accommodations, different transport routes, all those kinds of things. And then there's all the stories about the most embarrassing moments I've had. Uh, I'll probably writing, be writing a story about these four days I spent in Moldova and the kind of accommodations I had there, which I've already mentioned quite a bit in this interview. And, um, you know, I just uh, recently teamed up with Crag Hoppers in the UK. So I'm going to be promoting their clothing line. And uh, the newest thing, actually, is I've just enrolled in film school. So I'm going to be adding a whole vlog uh, aspect to my blog, a YouTube channel, getting some new equipment for that, um, you know, shooting in 4K, and kind of taking basically my whole blog up to the next level. And um, I've also been, because my uh, name is Sky Class, uh, Class is actually Dutch, but I spell it C-L-A-S-S, -S, and um, it kind of opened up, you know, travel with class. So, you know, getting some nicer designer clothes, staying in some boutique hotels, and kind of giving a, a nicer aspect to travel, um, because I think that people deserve to do that when they're traveling the world and getting the most out of their experience. So I'm curious, how did you get on these press junkets? So... A few different ways. Um, there's been some places that kind of contacted me out of the blue, uh, usually from spotting, uh, spotting my social media. I've got about 35,000 followers now, between, uh, mostly between Instagram and Twitter. Uh, Facebook, Pinterest, and Google Plus are kind of struggling along, but catching up slowly. Uh, but I've had um, uh, Scotland and Switzerland actually uh, contact me through those. Um, some of them I've reached out to. I'm currently working with Visit Portugal. I'll be on a press tour next week with them uh, for a few days. Uh, some of them have been through bigger blogger uh, conventions or groups. Uh, there's some kind of uh, by invitation only uh, Facebook groups for uh, mm -hmm. blogger travel blogger press tours. Um, and really, it, it does start to get into um, 
you know, who do you know? But in all honesty, that applies to almost any job in the world. It's like you need to network. Yeah. And that should be, you know, the first thing you start doing the moment the the idea of a travel blog crosses your mind. Just immediately start networking, looking at other blogs. Like I said, I've met some of the top bloggers in the world. Um, and, you know, I'm constantly working with them, uh, asking them, you know, about things, collaborating with them. Uh, I think just this past week, I've worked on five or six different collab blog pro- posts with some of the, these bloggers. Nice. And uh, it all goes into, you know, tying together. Uh, but you really, uh, some of them, you know, uh, some of these press tours have thresholds. You have to have 10,000 or 30,000 or 100,000 followers just to be considered. And then you're competing with however many right. bloggers. Uh, right. I just finished a, a press tour in um, Romania that actually had 500 bloggers apply for. Wow. Uh, and 70 of those actually went there for that. Uh, so again, and this is a huge press tour. Some of them are only six or eight people. So it really just depends. So how many days would a press tour be? Um, I'd say most of them are, I'd say a good amount of them, like four or six days. Uh, I've four been, to six days. Yeah. Okay. Not 46. <laughs> there is, uh, there's one coming up in November in Romania again. Uh, that's a two-week press trip. Um, now there's some, like... Uh, there's one in Canada that's a three-month press trip. And it's like, Big country. Yeah. And uh, I think that one's actually being sponsored by Toyota, where oh, okay. it's two team or three teams of two people, and they're given a Toyota and all of their gear and travel money and everything. And they're basically... Yeah. And they're told, you know, drive across the country and document everything. Wow. Um, you know, some of the cruise... Ricky, lines. we should do that. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I have. I actually got sponsored by Volkswagen to drive across the prairies. Uh, so it wasn't all the way across the whole country, but it was a little portion of it. And uh, Volkswagen flew me over to the prairies. Uh, then they paid for everything, the hotels, the food, uh, the transport, the gas, and then flew us back from Alberta. So, yeah, I've done something similar, Sky. Yeah, exactly. And it's, um, again, it's, it also depends on who you're working with. If it's... Um, you know, I'm actually working with the tourism board of Portugal. Uh, sometimes it's um, a smaller, like, private uh, tourism company. Uh, like, the, in uh, Romania, it was Experience Bucharest. Um, sometimes it's, like, a single tour company where I'm working with uh, Active Ukraine here in the Ukraine or Haggis Adventures in Scotland or Shamrock Tours in Ireland. Uh, sometimes it's just like a single tour guide, um, okay. who wants to take me around for two or three days. Oh, cool. And then you get, you give great publicity and people learn about all the things in the, uh, the neighborhood or the area that you're in. Yeah. The whole thing about the press tours is they're mutually beneficial. You know, I'm promoting their country and they're helping me with my blog, uh, whether with the links or just promoting my blog on their sites, um, you know, but it, it also kind of ties into the question, how much time do I spend working on my mm-hmm. blog or on these things? Right. And the truth is you never stop working. You know, when I'm sleeping in the bed, I'm, you know, processing what my next story is going to be, or I'm <laughs> literally laying there thinking about how comfortable the bed is or how uncomfortable it is, uh, depending on the story. Right. right. Um, but, you know, even today, you know, we we're at uh, lunch together and you know, I'm taking the photos of the picture, the photos of the food. And yes. you go, oh yeah, I got to take that picture. <laughs> uh, we took some great pictures of the food, and the food was delicious. Oh yeah, <laughs> Italian Venetian restaurant here in uh, Odessa. There you go. Def- definitely a tourist town. Yes, Odessa is a tourist town. Uh, no awesome, there. Sky. You know. Yeah, I, I wish I was there with you. You know, I, I love taking food pictures. I love uh, sightseeing with uh, fellow travelers. So, unfortunately, the only way we're able to connect today is through the power of technology. Uh, Sky, you've been a great guest. Uh, you know, a great uh, wealth of insight into couch surfing, budget travel, uh, travel blogging, sponsored tours, etc. If people wanted to find out more, uh, tell us about your website and social media. If people wanted to thank you. 
your brain, find out more, and follow your adventures around the world. Sure. So my name is actually Sky with an E, S-K-Y-E. Uh, kind of modeled after the Isle of Skye in Scotland, which happens to be my favorite place in the world, uh, which I'm kind of nice how that worked out. Uh, happy that how that worked out. But um, so my website is Sky Travel, so S K Y E T R A V E L S S at the end, and spelled the American way, not the British way, with the two L's. Uh, I didn't realize it would be that hard uh, with that uh, website when I first came up with it. But um, so skytravels.com and all my social media, my Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook page and everything is all Sky Travels. And um, yeah, I, I basically am doing a photo a day on Instagram, uh, six photos a week. And I go through six different categories now, uh, kind of a new format I'm setting up. So I do a landscape photo, a food photo, um, I think there's a architectural photo, a selfie a sunset and a drink. Um, uh, Twitter is more of my account for working with businesses and promoting kind of like a, uh, if I'm like on a press tour, I'm doing constant feed and what's going on, where I'm going, where I'm eating. And Facebook is more of just like the daily updates of my adventure, uh, depending on what you're interested in. And like I say, I'm, I'm planning to launch my official YouTube channel very shortly. And uh, that's kind of going to be a surprise format, but I think it's going to be a more of a unique format of what I'm going to be doing with that. Uh, I'm definitely, I've been watching some of the greats like uh, Casey and, uh, you know, Devin Supertramp. In fact, it was, uh, it's the cameraman for Devin Supertramp that I'm studying under for my film school. His name is Parker Walbeck, and I'm taking his film school. So I'm looking forward to really getting a high quality education out of that. Cool. Well, thank you very much. This is the first time we've been able to actually shave someone's hand and say thank you for joining us, Scott. I really appreciate having you on the show. Hey, thanks so much for your time today, Sky. And, uh, you know, I know you guys are enjoying uh, Ukraine. You know, I got, uh, I'm kind of jammed out there with you, but I'm, I'm sure I'll talk across. Maybe over in Canada when you end up doing your press trip over there, or maybe somewhere else in the world. The world is small, and the Traveler Network is a small community, so I look forward to crossing paths. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to this episode of Digital Nomad Mastery. Make sure you follow Sky as uh, Sky travels uh, across the web on his uh, blog, on his social media. He mentioned, uh, you know, his cool Instagram account. And stay tuned for his YouTube channel as well. Uh, so thanks for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe. Leave us a rating and review. That helps us in our, our podcast. If you're listening to this, also, uh, you know, check out the video version of the interview as well. And once again, we apologize about the bad internet. But hey, what do you do when you're traveling? you got to live with it. And hopefully in the next few years, they'll create an amazing, super fast internet around the world for us digital nomads. So thanks, everyone. We'll see you in the next episode. Happy travels. And uh, make sure you subscribe to Digital Nomad Mastery, the podcast and the videocast where we teach you how to make money while traveling the world. Thank you.